as we join together and as we sing together. seasons come and go and uh, God is good all the time. We have uh, this this morning we have uh, a special testimony that's going to be read by, by Daniel. letter that I received from one of those people is to encourage you, to encourage you to continue to do the things that you're doing in the way of tithing and serving and helping at the food pantry and all the things that we do here. 
it's church or whatnot. We really are making a difference out there. We really are. We're reaching people that the church isn't used to reaching. People who are on drugs and lost and whatnot. We were reaching out to some this morning. And I mean to encourage you today and let you know that, hey, what you're doing matters. The ties, the offerings, the volunteer, your time, it matters. You're going a long way in changing the lives of people who, who really need change, who really need help, who really need hope. And Baptist Temple, you are that. So before I read this letter, I want you to give yourself a round of applause. This is possible because God is able to use you in a special way to send me to meet people that we otherwise might not be able to meet. And with that, I want to read you this letter. This is from a lady named Michelle. Some of us know her. Is Vernon here this morning? Vernon knows her. He ministered to her in the garden a few times. A little girl about this big. Um, really sweet girl just with a lot of problems. We worked on her for a long time. We prayed with her. We gave her clothes and food and love and the word of God and fellowship. And all these things to anyone who comes there. And their letter reads this way. Danny, it's Michelle. I finally made it to the rehab I wanted, that I needed, that I needed to go to. I've not only detoxed, but I've committed myself to six months of treatment. I'm still not sure I made the correct decision, but here I am. In doing so, my spirit says yes, but my flesh still struggles. How about you? Is everything going well? In the church, those people who loved me and invited me and called me their friend? Have you all finished remodeling yet? As you know, I'm so grateful for the help provided from Baptist Temple. The clothes, the food, the snacks, even the things that people stole from me. I learned not to get mad, but just to give it to the Lord and say, Lord, it's not mine, it's yours. This is the confidence that I built there with y'all. I know it didn't seem like I was making a difference, but you were. God works every day. God works everything out, bad for the good. Always. I'm definitely hurt, but not upset, not broken. I'm bothered and I'm rebuilding and I'm bruised, but I have faith, I have hope. That the work we do together, the work that was done there, would no doubt we just smart. Thank you. Anyway, thought I'd write to you in case you're wondering where I am. For those of you who don't know her, she's a sweet girl. And because of you and because of the things that we hold dear here, our prime directive is discipleship, to reach people where they are to go wherever we need to go and do whatever we need to do to reach these people. And I'm telling you right now, you're making a big difference in the world today. You're making a big difference in this community today. There are some people sitting right here in this room right now that are a direct result of what we do across the street at the thrift store in this community under the bridge and all over this area. They're sitting here right now, learning to be discipled and growing in the faith, all because of our faith and our work together. So keep it up, Dr. Stumble. Keep working, keep praying, keep receiving. Keep doing what God has called you to do, and I promise you we will see them come by the way many, many, many more times. God bless Amen.
I'm reading this book by a brilliant anthropologist. He's, uh, he writes well, he thinks deeply, he explains things well, except that he is an atheist. Not just any atheist, but the one who goes out of his way to prove there is no God. Now, I gotta tell you, I love science. I know, why don't I marry her, right? As a, as a, in elementary school, my parents bought me a little chemistry set for Christmas and a microscope, and I spent a lot of time with it. Clearly, they saw something in me. You see in the pictures that I take how much I enjoy nature, particularly bugs. I know, you know, cats and dogs are cute, but wow, a grasshopper is so fascinating, and how different one animal is. I, I love all that stuff. I like facts. I like things I can touch. This atheist anthropologist says that Christians are afraid of evolution. We're afraid of the idea that God doesn't exist because somehow that would make us less. I'm wondering why he spends chapter after chapter after chapter harping on this. Maybe he's the one that's afraid that God might exist. Because his lifestyle would be called into question. He says that science cannot prove that there is a soul. I believe that. Science cannot prove there is not a soul. In fact, the more that science tries to prove that somehow or another we just, I don't know what evolved, they can't fathom the fact that God could have created us the way we are. But somehow they can fathom the fact that nothing created us out of nothing and somehow we got here. Now, I am not here to argue against evolution and all that stuff because it doesn't matter how we actually got here. Something has to be greater than something has, has had to get us where we are. So, I'm going to look at this a little bit scientifically, if we can allow history to be scientific. And today, I'm going to start a series uh, of sermons based on the letters of John, the Apostle, the one that Jesus loved. And, he's, and this is what John says, opening up 1 John 1.1. 1, 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. John is an eyewitness. He has given us eyewitness testimony to Jesus, the basis of our faith. He saw everything Jesus did. He was one of Jesus' closest students, part of the inner circle. You know, Jesus had all, all these followers, and then he had the twelve, and among the twelve he had the three. They were closest to him, and John was one of those. John saw Jesus transfigured on the mountain. Transfigured meant that Jesus allowed John and two others to see his glorification, his godliness, in a way that those have not seen it. He allowed it to shine through. I don't know exactly what it looked like, but I'll tell you what, John knew what it looked like. He understood it. John also was there at the crucifixion. And while John is there watching the Lord die, the Lord looks down on him and says, Take care of Mary, my mother. Take care of her as if she was your own mother. John and Jesus were very close. And he saw Jesus come back to life. Eyewitness testimony we have here. Not some kind of fable. Our faith is based on, real, on a real person and real events seen and heard by real people about a real person about the one true God we have to go out of our way to say that John is a liar because generally we accept testimony the way it is you know I know that sometimes we can exaggerate things like the Alamo but the facts of the Alamo are true history is true and this is eyewitness testimony without any formal greeting John doesn't up, uh, open up and say oh my friends or anything like that he just goes right to it 
And he points out some things about Jesus. He says that Jesus was from the beginning. And if you recall, earlier, John had written in the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then a few verses later, he says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And this is what Paul said, this is what John is saying. He was from the beginning. Jesus was existed at creation. There was never a time when Jesus did not exist. The apostles were able to hear the divine thoughts of God in a human voice. They heard his parables, they heard his moral teachings. His prayers, his rebukes, his encouragements, his blessings, they heard the word of God. They beheld him. Jesus was not a ghost or a phantom. You know, uh, when they made the movie Gandhi, so many years ago, in fact it was in the last century, they had advisors that were trying to tell, you know, they were helping them, Hindu advisors that were helping them, and they did not want Gandhi to be represented by a person. They wanted him to be represented just by a beam of light. I said, well, how, what craziness is that? Gandhi was a human being, and he had great teachings. He was not God, but Jesus, who was God, came to us in flesh and blood, a real person. They could see him. They could watch him. Him heal. All, everybody could see him. They saw him raise the dead. They saw him give sight to the blind. Heal the leper. He caused the lame to walk. He cast out demons. And he fed the multitudes. That's a whole bunch of miracles all over the place. That some seem greater than others, right? I mean, when you raise someone from the dead, certainly feeding the multitude seems like a, 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 an easy thing to do. The followers of Jesus touched him physically and were physically touched by him. Jesus was a real flesh and blood man. Even after the resurrection, he ate with them. And he had them touch his wounds to see that he was who he was. His touch was healing, fortifying, the cleansing touch of God. He still touches people. You know, he still offers to all who will reach out and grasp him to touch him in faith his abundant life that he promised us. He still heals. He still strengthens. He still cleanses. God revealed himself to us in creation. The book of Romans tells us that we cannot deny the existence of God, even though some still do. That creation itself speaks of his glory, his wonder. You know, I've never been to the Grand Canyon, but I have been to the one in Amarillo. So I have seen some of this great majesty and power. I look at this planet, I look at all the evidence that we have, and how can we not know, how can we believe that this all happened by accident? You know, I have been in the vast ocean, in the middle of the ocean, where I can't see land anywhere. <laughs> and I'm not just talking on a cruise ship where I know that land is just a little bit away. I'm talking about the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, in the middle of nowhere. Where somehow, by the way, a hurricane found us, but that's another sermon. <laughs> and I have seen the intricacies of an insect. You know, one of the most fascinating things, I recently took a picture of a grasshopper, and I look at that picture, I blow it up, I look at it close up, and I think, look at all these little tiny details. You know, that some of them don't make sense. I'm sure they make sense to somebody who studies insects, but to me, they're just, makes the insect, well, I don't want to say pretty. I mean, come on, the grasshopper's not pretty, but it is interesting. God reveals himself in nature, but creation alone could not tell the story of God's love, so he sent his son to us to demonstrate his love, to demonstrate just the tremendous love that God has for us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father. Jesus
Jesus said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is God's revelation of Himself. That's why the Apostle John called Him the Word of Life. To know Jesus Christ is to know God, and to know Jesus is to know life. He imparts this life, His life to all who trust Him. A flesh and blood, real person, real historic events, actually there. And we want to deny it. But we I don't mean I, sorry. <laughs> Some want to deny it. How's that? It continues in verse 2. It says, The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father that has appeared to us. You know, this is not just an interesting story. Oh, you know, God became flesh, dwelt among us, healed people, did great things, taught us some wonderful moral lessons. No. He came to bring us eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world might be saved through Him. There was a purpose to Jesus' coming, and that purpose was eternal life. This life which the apostles proclaimed is intensely personal. Personal, I'm sorry. It, it was, it's personal. You see, it wasn't the physical nearness of Jesus saved the apostles. It's not like Jesus was going to put in a good word for them. It was the spiritual presence of Jesus that changed them. They knew Jesus as Lord and Savior and committed their lives to Him. Jesus Christ was real and exciting to John and the other apostles because they had trusted Him and experienced His life. By trusting Christ, the life of Christ became evident in their lives. You know, it seems like they had their own resurrection. You know, the Bible tells that after Jesus was buried, the apostles were ready to give up. They probably would have told great stories about Him in their old age, about the things they saw. So Jesus' death and His burial was only a small part of what was about to happen. The resurrection changed everything. And when they saw the resurrected Savior, they came back to life. No longer were they afraid. You see, because it's one thing to have a good life. It's another thing to have an abundant life. But to have life everlasting, that's everything. That is the hope that we have. And they witnessed that directly. And now they want to tell everybody. They want to tell you that there is life everlasting for those who follow Christ, for those who accept Him the way the apostles accepted Him. To have Jesus is to have life. To have real life. To have eternal life. That life is offered to us through Jesus Christ. You know, there was a professor, a famous theologian, who spoke for two hours. Two hours this man spoke, proving that the resurrection of Jesus was false. Back then, he wasn't smart enough to tell you that there is no God. But he was telling you that there is no Christ, there is no Christianity, that he quoted book after book, scholar after scholar, saying this whole resurrection of Jesus is a hoax, and because it's a hoax, you have no hope. Christianity is just built on a bunch of fables and stories that aren't true. And so there was one gray-haired old man there, an old preacher. He says, I have a question, Professor. Everybody looked at this old guy. I mean, you can just imagine. And he had brought a sack lunch. This was, you know, a, a lunch and learn kind of thing. And he pulls out an apple. And he takes a bite. Just one question. This apple, is it tart or is it sweet? Everybody kind of looks at him, looks at each other, looks at the professor. The professor looks puzzled. You know, crazy old man, right? What the heck? How did he get here? And he says, Sir, 
I can't possibly know whether your apple is sweet or whether it's tart because I have not tasted it. The professor took another bite and he said, neither have you tasted my Jesus. The Bible tells us, taste and see that the Lord is good. If I ever had a chance to sit down with this learned anthropologist, I would not bother to talk to him about atheism because unless he's willing to taste and see Jesus, he's not going to understand or care. You cannot force or argue someone into faith. I know I was trained to force and argue people into faith. Because I'm a Baptist, let alone a pastor, we, we've had this training all the time. A, B, C, you know, the Roman road, all of these arguments, and they're brilliant, and I love them, and I understand them, but what I do understand that unless someone, uh, unless the Spirit speaks to you, you're not going to understand because the things of the Spirit are not understood by the natural man. Although sometimes we go out of way. It's very convenient for some people that there is no God. Can you imagine being so deep in your sin that you would prefer to disappear? You prefer to die and that's the end of all existence? That that's more... And certainly that is better than hell, isn't it? That you would deny the abundant life that God is offering you now for the pleasures of the flesh. John is warning us. Well, he's not warning us. That's not the right word. He is showing us the way that we can go to eternal life. This rich life that he has enjoyed. You know, John was the last of the apostles to die. He's already an old, old man when he's writing these letters. He's writing these letters from Ephesus. The church has already been kicked out of Jerusalem at this point and is spread out all over the world. He is going to be exiled to the island of Patmos where he will write the Revelation. He is the oldest and respected Christian on earth, the last witness to Jesus. And he's writing us these letters to let us know that this is real, that this happened. We proclaim to you, he continues in verse 3, what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make your joy complete. To make your joy complete. God wants us, God wants to have a meaningful relationship with you. This personal relationship opens the door for fellowship. We want to be wanted. We hate loneliness. God said in Genesis that it's not good for the man to be alone. We want friends, we want fellowship. And you know, one of the great gifts that God has given us is the ability to find our own little tribe. You know, you go to high school, everybody's got their own little Even the nerds have their own little table. They might be unpopular in society, if you will, but they're popular among themselves. And then one day they grow up to have their own little lunch table at the, like in uh, Big Bang Theory, where they get to rule who gets to sit at their table. But we want companionship. You know, there was a popular TV show that went on for years and years, Cheers, about a group of people that would gather in a bar for fellowship. It's an amazing little bar. It's a bar like you've never seen before. Where nobody's drunk and the lights are bright. <laughs> and long before we had a lot of smoking, nobody smoked in there. It was about friends. About a place where you could belong. A place where everybody knows your name. But that went on and on. It was very popular. We had this a TV show called Friends where all these people are separated 
from their families and they're all kind of gathering together in a little group of friends. They become a family un unto their own. You know, that was repeated over and over again, you know, uh, like in Seinfeld. Except when you saw Seinfeld's parents, you know why they wanted to be away from them. <clears throat> all the parents in that show were a little weird, weren't they? We want this fellowship. We want to be wanted. We long to be in a place where community touches us. Fellowship around the Word of God is Christ's answer to the lonely life. Joy is the answer to the emptiness of life. Joy is not something we manufacture. Although we do want to manufacture, we put it in, in pills. I don't know what, why I came across this article while I was doing research, but there was an actual pill that was abused, you know, a, an upper, and they talked about that the effects of this upper was one that made you feel good. Euphoric is the word. See, and scientists can't feel good. They have to feel euphoric. And I thought, wow, you know, this pill made you feel good. And I remember now because I, I looked it up because I wanted to see what uh, Johnny Cash was on. I was watching Johnny Cash's biography again. And what, what pill was he taking? Well, it made him feel euphoric. Apparently, what you've, you've, the definition of euphoric and what Johnny Cash was going through looked like two different things, but he wanted to have happiness, and he kept searching. I know this wasn't his song, but he was looking for love in all the wrong places. And this is what we do. We want this fellowship. We want community. And we want happiness. We want euphoria. I got a better word. How about abundant life? How's that for a word? We want abundant life, and we're not going to get it from a pill. We're not necessarily going to get it from other people, but yet this fellowship, when we do it around the Word of God, when we do it in small groups and Bible studies and worship, then we can experience the abundant life. See, sin gives you the promise of happiness, but you can never find joy. Sin is a cause of unhappiness and overwhelms our world today. I look at this invasion of the Ukraine and the continual escal escal escalation, and I wonder what in the world is going on? Why would you do that? How is this going to bring happiness to anybody? What do you think the end of the result is going to be? You know, you can read a history of World War II and you can look at it didn't work. And perhaps that's the worst example because it's global, but there's so many minor tragedies being played out in personal lives, in the lives of our neighbors, in the lives of our friends, in the lives of our family, where sin is being used as a substitute for joy. Sin promises joy, but only produces sorrow, and even when it does produce temporary happiness, it goes away. And it leaves, worse, leaves you worse in the wake. Eternal life is everlasting. And the joy that is beyond anything the world can take away. In fact, God's joyful pleasure is not only everlasting, but Jesus said that they will not be taken away. The night before Jesus was crucified, he tells his apostles, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and my joy may be complete, and that your joy might be full. It's clear that when the apostles were with Jesus, they experienced joy. That's why Jesus left them the written word, his words, so that they would not lose that joy. We're full of joy because it's a deeper reality than the sufferings that we might feel from time to time. I wonder, are you experiencing joy in your life? The joy that Jesus brings. The joy that brings fellowship with other believers. 
You can experience that right now, right this moment. You can give up whatever it is that you are substituting for Jesus and then just turn your heart to Him. And if you've experienced this joy, are you sharing it with others? You know, we do need to make a verbal witness of our faith. The Bible tells us to be prepared to give an answer for, the faith, for our faith, for the joy, for the assurance that we have in our hearts. But we can't share our joy with a sorrowful look. We can't be angry and filled with joy. We can't be judgmental and feel filled with joy. Our actions reflect the joy in our heart. It should be bubbling, bubbling out of us. People should want to be around us. You know, um, it might help if you see someone that's headed for hell to think of them with love in your heart. Because they're experiencing the best moment of eternity while they're alive. It's a lot easier to give a witness of your faith to someone when they want to know what's in you. You know, I remember going to church as a teenager and listening to the preacher preach. I'm not going to say he preached in tongues, but that's what it sounded like to me when he read from the King James. English was a second language to me. King James apparently was a third. <laughs> I understood enough. But it wasn't penetrating my heart. They gave an invitation every Sunday, and I didn't know what I was supposed to do. But I saw in the life of the preacher and his family something completely different. And I want to know what that is. The joy was bubbling up. You know, there was all kinds of trouble. And sometimes there was anger. You know, it wasn't perfect. But the joy bubbled up through all the stuff. At the end, it's like watching a sitcom where everything's going wrong, and at the end, everything is right. It was kind of like that, you know, where like, even if it was wrong, the joy still bubbled up. And I wanted to know what that was. And the preacher shared the gospel with me and invited me to be baptized and I and joined the church, and I did those things. It still took a while to understand, completely, theologically, you know, intellectually. But my heart was changed, and God was protecting me. I, God is offering that to you right now, this moment. We're going to sing a song right now, and as we listen to that song, I want you to reflect on what God is telling you right now, right this moment. Is it time for you to take that first step of faith? Is it time for you to take a second step of faith and maybe return to something that you've walked away from? Is it time for you to commit yourself? To start walking that walk and showing it to others. So we're going to listen to the song now. Pull out your communication card and write down what God is telling you. And share it with us in the uh, offering plate before you leave today.
Love with you and to share it abundantly everywhere you go. Amen. 